I, like many children of the 90s or late 80s, watched Beetlejuice religiously as a kid. It was one of the very first VHSs I would rent from Blockbuster at the time. Ordinary video stores don't even come close to Blockbuster Video. Much of Tim Burton's style and films are built upon the paradox of opposites, the nightmare before Christmas, the polar opposites of Halloween and Christmas converging, Edward Scissorhands, an innocent kind heart with the hands of Freddy Krueger. What? I was just about. And Beetlejuice is no different. In much of the film, you can see this contrast of complete polar opposites. The conflict between life and the afterlife, the ghost of a middle-class young couple, older, extremely wealthy city hipsters from New York, the Caribbean-style calypso music of Harry Belafonte in contrast to a small, quiet town in Connecticut. Even Lydia and Beetlejuice are polar opposites on an archetypal level. While much of the film I think is largely meant to be just pure visual spectacle with cool practical effects that are just purely entertaining, the film also contains symbolism, allegory, and metaphor. The clearest example of this is the use of the planet, Saturn. Immediately after Adam and Barbara realize that they have passed away, they quickly learn that when they attempt to leave the house, they are transported to a vast sandy desert with planetary bodies in the background with massive sandworms, which of course is Saturn. Look, we've been to Saturn. Hey, I've been to Saturn. Sandworms. You hate them, right? Here is something you may have never seen before. Here is a deleted alternative scene of Adam encountering Saturn for the first time, which reveals the deeper meaning behind what Saturn actually is. Rather than sand, he sees massive gears like the inner workings of a clock or a machine, representing the inner workings of reality and time. The final choice made by Burton of a sandy planet can represent the sands of time, like a massive planetary hourglass. The sandworms consume death within time, hence why they go after Barbara and Adam. Father Time's image comes from the ancient Roman god of time, Saturn. The ancient Greeks often referred to Saturn as Kronos, which means time, hence where the word chronological is derived from. Saturn is usually portrayed as an old man with a scythe. Within the more esoteric, Kabbalistic tree of life symbolism, Saturn is metaphysically associated with the Sephra Bina, which is known as the Supernal Mother. Archetypically, it's that which gestates the form and structure behind reality itself or time. It's both birth and death, as both are dependent on each other. It's that which separates the different aspects of reality or form. I know that's a, probably a little too deep for a lot of people, but... All of this word salad shit is what Barbara and Adam are encountering every single time that they try to leave their home. Geographical and temporal perimeters. Functional perimeters vary from manifestation to manifestation. The name Beetlejuice itself also has astronomical slash astrological significance. Beetlejuice is one of the brightest visible stars to the naked eye in the Orion constellation. Moving on from stereo instructions onto psychological instructions, archetypically Beetlejuice himself operates largely as the id in psychological terms, the part of the mind in which innate, instinctive, and impulsive things occur. The id is the primitive, basic, and fully unconscious part of the personality. When Barbara and Adam first encounter Beetlejuice, he operates with absolutely zero impulse control. He literally just says and does anything he wants at any given moment making constant sexual advances at every moment he possibly can. In contrast to this is Lydia being the exact opposite, hyper-observant, operating entirely off of being conscious of her actions, so observant she can see the dead and things normal people can't usually see. I myself am strange and unusual. Uh, beetle juice? Yes, that's it! Beetlejuice wants to get out of the afterlife and death, while Lydia wants to get to the afterlife. Beetlejuice. It's showtime. This desire for both of them is what allows Beetlejuice in the end to make his deal with Lydia in order for her to save the Maitlands. An interesting parallel to this exists within Greek mythology with Hades and Persephone. One of the rare times Hades, the god of the underworld, leaves the underworld in order to kidnap and marry Persephone, which parallels Beetlejuice and Lydia. In order for me to do that, hey, I gotta get married. 
Hey, these aren't my rules. I'm Lydia Dietz and I'm of sound mind. The man next to me is the one I want. You ask me, I'm answering. Yes, I love that man of mine. In many depictions of Hades he is seen holding or accompanied by serpents or snakes, there is a constant association of Beetlejuice with snakes in the film. You could even see Beetlejuice as the big snake as a phallic sort of energy. That phallic energy being directed at Edgar Allan Poe's daughter, Lydia. We come for your daughter, Chuck. <laughs> and this is why, immediately after the big snake, where does he go? He goes here. You bunch of losers! The only one I think I can deal with is Edgar Allan Poe's daughter. I'm feeling a little uh, anxious, if you know what I mean. It's been about 600 years after all. He's feeling a little, you know, spiky or horny, right? Yeah, here I come, baby. Adam, why did you build that? I didn't. And in the original draft of the script, before Tim Burton made it a comedy, it had Beetlejuice having his way with Lydia, if you know what I'm saying. This is all a rewrite based on the same premise. The climax of the film revolves around the forced marriage of Beetlejuice and Lydia, a sort of marriage between life and death, but Beetlejuice is ultimately defeated by the sandworm of Saturn or time. And then the ultimate conclusion to the film shows the polar opposites as represented by the families, the Dietzes and the Maitlands living together in harmony. The living and the dead, harmonious lifestyles and peaceful coexistence. Really not sure what happens to these New Yorkers, no one really seems to care all that much, and notice the numbers on the clock when the Dietzes arrive, or the New Yorkers. The hands are pointing at 9-11, which is used in many films neurologically to point towards a coming emergency. Anyway, just wanted to do this video and talk about Beetlejuice in the way that I do, leading up to Beetlejuice Beetlejuice, which literally might be the most anticipated and epic sequel in the history of Hollywood. Michael Keaton's Beetlejuice is one of the most recognizable cult classic characters in cinematic history, at least in my opinion, and to get a sequel this many years later is absolutely insane. I really hope Tim Burton sticks to some level of practical effects and doesn't completely ruin it with too much CGI. But regardless of how good the film actually ends up being, to see Michael Keaton again as Beetlejuice is pretty freaking sick. Anyways, thanks for watching. Please like, share, subscribe, comment below. Thank you very much, and...